Hi, folks. My name is Sherry Clough, and I'm the Curriculum Coordinator for the Peace Literacy Institute. And we're going to talk today um, about uh, the curriculum that we have at the Peace Literacy Institute that supports the three elements of peace literacy that Paul Chappell shared with you in our previous video in this series. So I'm going to sort of map out some of our curriculum. All right. When, when last we left our heroes, uh, we were looking at these three elements, and Paul was walking you through the innermost circle here, these are capacities. Sometimes we use a metaphor of muscles. So we talked about the muscle of imagination, hope, curiosity, language, appreciation, discipline, conscience, reason, and empathy. And Paul's research has led him to categorize all the different kinds of capacities we could imagine being important for education generally and education and peace specifically, and was able to um, fit them into these nine main categories here. Then let's look up uh, to these skills, and there's lots, but just to talk about a few, cultivating calm in ourselves and others during conflict, um, that makes sense. It's certainly important for working on peace. Uh, leading by example, Paul's going to talk about that one a little more in the next video. Listening with empathy, hugely important. Everyone usually recognizes that this one's important. It is a lot harder to do than we might think. And if you think of it as a skill, that means you need to practice it and you'll get better at it. And here's one that was new to me, recognizing distress in ourselves and others. Uh, this is a pretty main feature of, and I think unique feature of uh, the approach we take in peace literacy. And let's now work at this uh, outermost uh, circle, this outermost layer of the three elements. This is where peace literacy helps us gain a more accurate understanding of the world and our place in it. And with respect to sort of traditional education, this is where a lot of the disciplinary approaches would go like history, different sciences, mathematics, language arts, social studies would all go in, in here. Um, those are important ways in which we help uh, students of all ages gain a more accurate understanding of the world and their place in it. But we are seeing around us the failures to include a broader set of features of the human condition about which we ought to have all of us a more accurate understanding. So the main focus here for peace literacy is uh, that humans have nine non-physical needs, such as belonging and self-worth, that help us get our physical needs met. And many of you have heard Paul Chappelle um, lecture uh, and share some of his research on rethinking the ways in which Maslow has, has in his hierarchy, placed physical needs at the base. Uh, in fact, there, it's a much more complicated uh, nest and non-physical needs such as belonging and self-worth are drivers of our behavior in ways we sometimes don't even realize. And um, equally important is to learn that trauma is pretty ubiquitous and can become tangled with our non-physical needs with pretty predictable consequences. So when we have these uh, non-physical needs and we are either not aware of them or we're unable to meet them in healthy ways, and or we have a traumatic experience um, that can get what uh, Paul calls uh, tangled up in, in their attempts to meet those needs. Um, fairly predictable and negative outcomes, rage, alienation. And we've got a lot of research on the website that pairs up the non-physical need and the kind of traumatic response that sometimes is associated with it. Um, we've been talking a lot about justice and equity. He, a piece of the puzzle here for peace literacy is that the introduction and maintenance of structural levels of injustice, sexism, racism, for example, these are often an unhealthy attempt to meet non-physical needs like belonging and self-worth. So individual actors collectively working together um, with unhealthy sources for their non-physical need for belonging and self-worth can sometimes be the site for the introduction and maintenance of these unjust systems. So there's lots of research now, for example, on um, white supremacist organizations, and they typically um, seek out uh, young teens who are struggling with belonging and self-worth. Um, race does not usually get introduced into the conversation right away. Instead, they appeal to uh, folks' sense of belonging and self-worth, 
And then racism then starts to get tangled up in that. Um, here's again, uh, uh, the, the bit about human aggression is a distress response. Um, and recognizing that when you're behaving aggressively or others are behaving aggressively towards you, that they're actually in distress, that requires a lot of empathy. So here's a nice way to think about how all of these three layers interact. And there's lots of ways we could talk about this, but in terms of human aggression being a distress response, that's a cognitive bit of understanding you ought to know. And then um, the knowing of it is of course wrapped up in the doing of it, this skill, recognizing distress in ourselves and others. So there's uh, a certain understanding of the knowledge that aggression is a distress response. And then that's embodied with this skill of recognizing distress in ourselves and others. So it's all very well to kind of know it, but the knowledge itself is wrapped up in and needs to be wrapped up in this habitual kind of recognition when you're in distress, oh, I'm in distress. Oh, this is why I'm behaving aggressively. That's a skill and it requires empathy. So here's that capacity here. So just in the same way that um, uh, being a really good basketball player requires having a certain muscle skill set, muscles and a certain skill set and a certain understanding of the rules. Similarly, when we think about um, peace literacy, you can think of uh, the muscle of empathy uh, being used in the skill of recognizing distress in ourselves and others, um, and then using that towards our more accurate understanding that that distress can lead to aggression. So that's some of the ways that these layers of uh, peace literacy, these elements are all intertwined. Hmm. Here's, um, you, you can tell in this one too, that there's a lot of um, uh, specific technical meaning we have attached to each of these words. So to solve the root causes of problems, we must embrace struggle, acquire training, pursue truth and choose strategy. Uh, we have curriculum that walks students through each of these. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here is um, really break down what does it mean to teach people about peace. It turns out you don't you don't start just assuming everyone knows what peace is or can do it. There's you have to scaffold it just like you would with any other skill, learning how to read, learning how to write, um, math literacy. You start with basic sorts of concepts and. Um, like going back to these capacities or muscles, it would never have occurred to me that part of my struggle with respect to peace would be related to my capacity for imagination and hope. So um, it's been really helpful working with Paul to sort of break down, working with Paul plus our educators, especially the ones working with really young people like in elementary ed and pre-K, because they're much better at figuring out when you have these big sorts of concepts, what are the things we need to do first, right? Um, so it turns out working out our, much, our muscles of imagination, hope, curiosity are gonna be super important for these skills, super important to help us with this accurate understanding. And then the final piece here is, and, and again, these are just examples. The final piece I could squeeze in on this diagram is that there are seven deep roots for developing healthy belonging in strong communities. And in our next um, uh, episode, in our next video in the series, Paul's gonna talk about those seven deep roots for developing healthy belonging in strong communities. I'm going to pause here and um, pivot to the website. Okay. And I'm just going to begin with our curriculum uh, page on the Peace Literacy Institute webpage. And as I note here that our curriculum materials have been created by a team of educators from pre-K all the way through university level, and they can be downloaded for free. This is something we do as a public service and any support you can give us to keep that work up would be great. Uh, and these materials can be modified for any number of contexts. Um, so some of them are kind of like a basic template. And then we have a team of folks, if, if you want to take a, a piece of the curriculum that hasn't quite yet been designed for preschool, let us know and we can get our preschool team on it and, and um, they can help you work through it. We also uh, can show how most of our materials can be used to meet Common Core and other regional standards. And not just sort of the obvious standards in social science. We've um, 
uh, one of the lessons I'll share with you, um, we've shown how you can use the lesson on um, our non-physical needs to help meet core standards in mathematics, for example. So um, you can contact me for more details about any of those. And there's my email address. And I'm at uh, Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon in the United States. Okay, so you'll see on this page, we've got our curriculum broken down into pre-K to fifth grade, middle school, high school, and college and adult. And some of the lessons, as I said, are repeated because they're kind of general templates that we can then um, make uh, more appropriate for younger folks or older folks. So let's just start with pre-K to fifth grade. And here's a picture of Paul with a bunch of, um, I think this was a group of folks that was, had um, kindergarten kids paired with fifth graders. They each had a, a buddy and um, this was in Canada. Okay, so Peace Literacy Lesson Plan 1. This is a three-part unit and it's where we really talk about understanding and healing aggression and applying, recognizing the plowing applying the power of respect. And uh, Paul's gonna talk about respect and the feature, the skills involved in showing respect in the, uh, if not the very next video in the series, the one right after. And then resolving conflict and the power of calm. And modified versions have been used for fourth to fifth grade students. And we have a uh, curriculum developer who's teaching a Spanish English immersion class. And he's working, I think, with third graders. And um, so he's working on making this lesson appropriate for even younger folks. And then we have the Garden of Strong Community. And this is um, where we really help folks, uh, younger folks, focus on their non-physical needs. And we use a metaphor of a garden. And we focus on just five of them, um, belonging, nurturing relationships, self-worth, challenge, Ah, I should know the fifth one, I forget. But out of the nine, we focus on five that are really important for the very young. And we get new curriculum in all the time from teachers in the field who uh, know our materials well and are working on new lessons. I'm now going to move us to uh, middle school. Okay, hi again. So these um, are the lessons and curriculum more generally that we've got designed for middle school kids. And we do have curriculum um, that we designed especially for helping students through the challenges of COVID. And this beautiful painting, it's sort of the more grown up version of that, that garden, uh, which is also a painting, um, that image of the garden both by the same artist, uh, an artist in New York who um, was very inspired by Paul's work on our non-physical needs and came up with um, these paintings to accompany the allegories. So um, again, Peace Literacy Lesson Plan 1, and this really is targeted quite nicely for middle school students. And here is the landscape of our human needs. So this goes through all nine of the non-physical needs and uses a metaphor of a landscape. So um, the orchard of nurturing relationships, for example, the river of expression, the ground of self-worth. All right, uh, this section here, um, Metis, an introduction. So this is a multi-part unit. It teaches how to make good decisions, take effective actions and unlock the power of waging peace. Uh, through a compelling allegory drawn from Greek mythology. And Metis was Zeus's first wife and the, one of the most powerful gods because she um, embodied wisdom. And it was understood in the Greek pantheon that her wisdom, because she embodied wisdom, she was stronger than Zeus, who had only brute force and violence at his disposal. Uh, so we use her as an example of um, the different kinds of capacities that we all need as humans to um, really nurture and develop our metis. And uh, this bit of curriculum here, the muscles of metis, the muscles of our humanity, takes students through those nine uh, muscles, uh, capacities that Paul talked about, empathy, conscience, imagination, curiosity, hope, language, reason, 
I'm missing one. Anyway, there's nine. Nine is a magic number. The constellation of peace. This was um, the feature that I had in the uh, more accurate understanding where I said um, that it's really important that we learn um, uh, um, through struggle to embrace challenge. And so here we are, the struggle of the stars of struggle, training, truth, and strategy. It's a, this is a four-part unit which leads students into a deeper and more practical understanding of peace that helps them navigate the storms of life, the uncharted waters of new technologies, and the turbulence of our national and global challenges. It's been designed for middle school, but can be modified to suit older students and adults. And we're particularly pleased with part three here, which is the it uses video games as an, an, as an allegory. And um, most of your students play video games. Maybe you play video games. Uh, they are rich sources for student learning and we walk through them uh, in an important allegory. Here is the curriculum that we designed particularly to help students through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many of the, uh, many of our lessons have um, PowerPoint accompaniments to them so they can be used um, for distance learning. Uh, and the navigating crisis uncertainty and technology was designed in particular for distance learning for middle school kids, their teachers and families to address the most urgent emotional and relational issues that students are facing in the midst of the pandemic. The lessons are richly illustrated in the following slides and um, really use for all of the slides, put them in presentation mode because they're all animated. So you can see the slides all move, the text moves, the images move, and they're pretty large files. So they might take some time to download. Right. All right. Those are the main lessons I wanted to take you through. And um, I'm just going to walk us back up to, Let's go to the landscape of our human needs. So here is where um, students learn about their nine non-physical needs, which include their need for belonging, right? And then you understand um, and learn about different skills that are required um, to help uh, form strong communities of belonging. And then in the innermost, those capacities or muscles, what are the muscles that you need um, or the capacities that you need to build strong communities of belonging. Um, so we'll walk you through some of those in the next video in the series, I believe. All right. Okay, I also wanted to share with you that we've got this element on our website that we've been working on with um, the team of Montessori Public Educators in Cleveland on um, a peace literacy approach to positive behavioral interventions and supports. Some of you might know this is PBIS. And we have an essay that got published in Montessori Public. You can link to it. And we're particularly interested and or concerned about the ways in which um, sort of standard approaches to PBIS um, can sometimes reinforce injustice and inequity. And um, we'd love your feedback or comments on our um, analysis in that essay. But here are some of the materials that are available to you. Again, downloading that you can download for free. Here is a poster of the three uh, elements of peace literacy that we have um, just uh, discussed and will continue to discuss in this series. Here is a poster that um, really focuses on the um, thinking about those three elements in terms of the behavior of students who are struggling and perhaps not bringing their best selves to the class. So here that, here's that poster a little bigger. I hope you can see it. So the first step is when you find yourself thinking that a child is being manipulative, unmotivated, attention seeking or defiant, try viewing the child instead as having a relative gap in their capacity, skills or understanding that makes them unable to meet a challenge they've experienced in the learning environment. And then in dialogue with the child and the learning community, consider what you can do to help develop the child's capacities, skills and or understanding. And the main claim here is that children do well if they can. Um, lots of research to suggest this. When, when we are not being our better selves, 
it's because um, we're unskilled or have not built up the muscles or don't have an accurate understanding of the setting. So we can come into the situation where um, a, a child, a colleague, a partner, a political leader is not bringing their best selves to the situation. How can we diagnose that um, as perhaps being related to some kind of gap in their capacity, skills, or understanding? And that gives us um, another way forward. Another poster that we have available for you. Oh, we got lots of good stuff here. We've got a poster um, uh, of the nine non-physical needs that um, I just mentioned. And Paul will be talking about the seven nutrients for healthy belonging. We also talk about these in the metaphor of roots. And then here, um, when I mentioned uh, that main lesson of peace literacy as being related to um, recognizing aggression as a distress response, the idea is when you see aggression at the surface, that heat of aggression, look for the fires. We use a metaphor of fires burning beneath. What is the distress or the fire burning beneath? And here are some pretty standard and fairly predictable forms of emotional distress that can cause um, that heat of aggression, fear, disrespect, frustration, insecurity, humiliation, betrayal, and shame, and the list goes on. And I have printed this poster up in color and posted it all over my office at work. <laughs> so sometimes I can just sort of diagnose where I am on the poster. Anyway, I just wanted to orient you to these materials. There's lots more. And this is on the page. Let's get you the URL. So www.peaceliteracy.org slash PBIS. Okay, thank you.